one. Uh, hi, good morning, folks. This is Rajiv. Um, good to be with you this morning. I'm going to go over um, excerpt from one portion of your corporate policy regarding what the corporate immigration um, intentions are. I don't call it policy. I don't call it a contract because really uh, this is an expression of what we intend to do with our immigration. And um, I am also in the middle of preparing a much larger conversation uh, for an audience. One audience would be lawyers, another audience would be other employers. So if time uh, permits us, I'll just run over uh, that, uh, run through that uh, presentation very briefly. So it will help you develop the rest of your policy. Now, um, I don't know if you folks got a copy of my uh, my my um, changes, but you don't really need it. I'll just go over them. The heading on the first page, where you talk about employee graduating from OPT to H1B, I added CPT, comma OPT to H1B because those are the two most common scenarios. And in fact, in the body of the policy, you do speak of CPT and you say it applies to CPT. So it makes sense uh, for consistency just to put CPT on top as well. That okay? Folks, that okay? Yeah. Okay. Then we go on to, uh, you say eligibility in relation to years of service. How can somebody qualify um, to be to have us apply for them for H1B? And we say that as long as they don't have an active performance improvement plan, which is fine. Um, and the second bullet point, they must also be in good standing. Do you define what good standing is somewhere in your handbook, or is this a new concept? Well, that was actually um, something that we wanted to discuss on the phone was really how do we determine, how do we define what an employee in good standing is? Um, so we were kind of hoping for a little, your guidance here. Let's get back to this point because further down, I have uh, changed certain things to make it clear that these are just um, guiding principles. These are not binding um, predetermined criteria that we are we are always going to abide by. So <clears throat> let's come back to this point. Must be in good standing. One way you can you can you can do it is you can say employee must be in good standing as determined. Oh, okay. I think somebody else is trying to log in. Okay, get, getting back to what I was saying. So one of the ways to define good standing probably would be uh, to just say that employee must be in good standing with the company as determined uh, solely within the discretion of the company or as determined by, this, by the company solely within its own discretion. So in, in other words, we don't need to define it beyond a certain point. We, we decide whether you are in good standing with us or not. I personally would actually even remove this and just leave it alone um, because employee, as long as they don't have active performance improvement plan, we can, I guess, they must be in good standing with us, no? Or do you want to define it differently? No, we, we do definitely agree with kind of like, well, it, it's a catch-all. If you have an improved uh, a PIT in place, you are probably not an employee within good standing. Um, however, I think we wanted to put that full clause in there to cover up in case there's something else perhaps going on that is not fully defined by a PIT. I would say, uh, I would say uh, criteria employee must need to be considered. Employee must have active performance improvement plan. Uh, and instead of saying a good uh, standing, you could make something like this. Employee must have a recommendation from the manager. Maybe something like that. Let the manager decide. No? I think our main concern with you know, putting too much uh, importance like, on the manager's 
true decision is that we don't want them to feel, you know, that it's all up to them. What if, like, that, you know, our employees' livelihoods and lives are in their hands that, you know, if they don't think they deserve recommendations, it's their fault. Uh, you know, if we're not offering them from an H1B, we don't want them to kind of like, or we don't want them to lie and say, like, well, this employee is, you know, not top notch. But I, I don't want to prevent them from uh, being sponsored for an H1B. So even though I don't really fully agree with it, I'm going to write them the recommendation. Okay. Let me, let me bring you to the bottom uh, first. Because in your disclaimers, I have changed the language of your disclaimer. You have in the bottom said disclaimer for all policies. Okay. And your disclaimer just said all decisions regarding visa sponsorship are subject to management discretion. Okay. Um, instead of that, what I did was I started off by saying, and I have actually sent a copy of this out already. I can always send you another copy if this is not you don't have it. So that's not a problem. I said, all policies are subject to applicable law, comma, advice of counsel, comma, and are an expression of corporate intention, comma, which is non-binding and does not create, amend, or abrogate any rights, express or implied, comma, under law or inequity. So in other words, this is something we intend to do. You cannot hold us to it. Okay. okay. And then I also said, in addition to what you had said, you had said all final decisions regarding visa sponsorship are subject to the management discretion. I changed that, removed the word final. I said all decisions regarding visa sponsorship are subject to management discretion and any policies may be changed without prior notice. Okay. Yeah. Once you have that, I think the the idea that um, you should not have to have good standing as a separate criterion is probably okay. But I leave that to you. We can discuss that further. For now, I'm leaving it in there. Talk it out. If you want to have a follow up conversation, we can talk about it. No problem at all. Okay. Absolutely. Then in, under the heading of costs incurred, I just added the word necessary before costs. We are not going to pay for unnecessary costs, but we are responsible for all necessary costs. So I just added, yeah, I added the word necessary. Then on the second page, um, uh, you have, um, one of the eligibility criterion for applying for green card is that they must have worked two years with the company under H-1B visa status. And I wanted to make you aware of two things. One is that it is highly, well, not, not likely, but at least possible that they may have worked with you already for a couple of years on OPT because, or CPT for example, or combination of CPT and OPT, because there is a regulation which is being considered and I think it's gonna be passed, which will allow people to get almost three years of OPT if they are uh, science, technology, engineering, math graduates. So you could have situations where employees have worked with you for two plus years on other status, status other than H1. Do you want to combine that with your H1 uh, or how you want to accommodate for that? You may want to talk about that. Yeah, no, I think we had been, we, we have discussed all this as a, as a management team. Okay. Um, before, traditionally, uh, we actually have it with, you know, once you serve three full years with the company, no matter what your status is, um, we will consider still sponsoring you for a green card. Um, in order to just safeguard the company in the last discussion that we had as a team, uh, we thought this, the, the, what, we, what we just wrote down would be best. Was, you know, after, it doesn't really matter how many years you worked under CPT or OPT, you have to still fulfill two years 
on your H-1B status with the company. Okay, another point to consider, um, when you apply for green card, green card times vary from country of birth to country of birth. If somebody is born in a country other than India, China, Mexico, Philippines, the countries that are very backed up, uh, they could be done with their green card process within a year to two years, whereas people from the backed up countries could be in the green card process for seven, eight, nine years. So are you losing any competitive edge by having this kind of a provision? Talk about it. Uh, again, this is a corporate decision. I really uh, cannot uh, canvas one way or the other. I can just say that this is one of the criteria you should think of. Hey, um, Raj, a quick question on the uh, understanding of a green card. Uh, the reason why we chose two years and begin application on a two year period is because uh, is, it, is it true that uh, once a person achieves the priority date for I 140, the, and if the H 1B expires, they're able to stay in the United States? Um, there are two ways you can continue to extend your H-1. Uh, if your green card has been pending for one year or if your I-140 is approved, either one of those two. Uh, there are regulations under consideration which would, which, which, which would make possible for an employee to leave an employer and not suffer uh, almost any adverse consequences once I-140 is approved and uh, has been approved for 180 days. They get to carry the priority date which they do once the I-140 is approved anyway and they get to carry their right to unlimited H-1 extensions to any employer that they wish to choose. And, and, and your definition I-140 approved is completely approved approved? or once you receive the receipt notice for the, for the I-140? The regulations that are being considered talk about the word approved, which means not the receipt, but the actual approval of the I-140. Okay, and how long does it normally take roughly for I-140 approval? You have, a cho you have a choice. Let's talk about the first step. Perm itself, from the day we start the case in our office to the day that actually gets approved, could be eight, nine months to a couple of years, depending upon how many problems we encounter. Usually it is within a year uh, from when we get started. Once the perm is approved, we've got 180 days to file for the I-140. So if you want to delay an I-140 filing, you can delay it up to let's say 170 days if you so choose. Um, once for it, once the I-140 is filed, again, there are two choices, premium or non-premium. If you file it non-premium, it can take many months, maybe four, five, six, seven, even eight, nine months. If you file it premium, you know how that goes. That's a matter of weeks. So from the time we start the green card to the time we get the I-140 approval could be as little as a year, maybe a year and a half. Uh, depending upon the choices we make and the difficulties we encounter. Okay. Okay. So, so I'm putting about roughly two two years max, roughly. I would say not max, but I would say one and a half to two years is optimum. Okay. Okay. So after that two years period, which is, uh, the employee has the eligibility to look for another job. Correct. They would they would be able to look for another job and carry almost all the benefits of a green card over to any job they want. Okay. Okay. So as far as the portion of the policy you sent out to me, these were the points that I had to make. Rest everything is okay. And I did send you my my comments and my 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 amendments this morning. Um, take a look at them. If they look okay, go ahead and put them in there. Uh, if you have any other questions, go ahead and ask me now, please. Okay. Okay. If uh, you... Yeah, I think... Yeah, go ahead, ma'am. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Okay, no, I was just going to go over very quickly 
corporate immigration policy, how it works, and just give you kind of an overview. Okay. All right, let me get started. You know, having, having a corporate immigration policy is not necessary, but it can help. Especially if you have the right disclaimers in place, it can help from many different angles. Um, one of the decisions you have to make is, is this a policy we want to keep within the management or is it a policy we want to share outside with the employees, with the staff, um, or there is going to be a mixture. Some policies are within ourselves, uh, within the management. Some policies are being shared out. So these are some of the decisions you will make as long as you have a clear indication that these are expressions of intention and not legal rights, uh, you will be okay. Okay. So let me run through or run uh, run through the, the various points I have. What is the what is the reason we want to have a, have an immigration policy? First reason is consistency. That way we know if we have 20 managers or 10 HR people, they are all following the same policy. Okay. Consistency is important internally for corporate governance, externally for employees. It's important for government audits and compliance. Sometimes as a corporation, let's say one of our managers made a mistake and they stepped outside the lines. Um, if we have a clear policy that could, to a certain extent, help us defend ourselves against uh, allegations of willful wrongdoing as a corporation, so instead of being becoming a corporate liability, it could then become a good argument against corporate liability. Okay, so that I think is a very important point. And the third point is the business angle. Uh, we have um, worked with many companies that went from being 10 employees to five, six, 700, 800 employees. And then when they got sold, because their policies were well-defined and well-implemented, um, some of these mergers and acquisitions we were able to complete in three days as opposed to three months when the documents are not properly defined and uh, properly um, orchestrated. So from a business angle, it could be good. It could be good for your um, uh, business partners to know what your policies are. For example, if you are working with the government and you have a teaming agreement or a subcontracting agreement, it would be important for your um, your partners to know what your policies are. So I think it's good from that angle as well. It helps you plan for the future, and especially for government contractors, where under federal acquisition regulations, you can be barred from government contracting if you're, if you're found to have immigration violations. I think it's a good idea to have a written immigration policy. Okay, everybody okay so far? Should I go on to the next point? So what should you include? And I think you should be including three areas ultimately when we develop. I will give you a much better guideline and I'll give you a set of checklists. Once I'm done, I'm writing like a certain article for um, um, American Law Institute. Once I'm done doing that, I will be able to give you the whole article as well as a quick conversation. Um, so you'll have a checklist on what I think you should be doing. What should you include? Pre-hiring. Before you hire, how would you recruit? how to avoid certain pitfalls that we have seen people step into not realizing these are violations of the law, recruitment, um, interviewing, onboarding, i nines. These are the policies that should be, and these are one or two lines, you, know, you don't want to write it and make it into a, uh, into a book. You want to keep it simple so people can follow it. Once employees are hired, how will, how will they be supervised how will they be moved around from project to project or place to place? And salaries, um, how they are to be paid, what can be deducted, what, what cannot be deducted. These are all highly choreographed under the H-1B regulations. So they should be in the policy so that your HR people and your managers know what you can and what you cannot do. When you lay off an employee, similarly, there are certain elements, certain things that you've got to consider. And we'll help you develop those policies as we go along. Next thing. Um, what to include for visa green card filing. I think you have that, you covered that part, F1 to H1, F1, H1, L1, et cetera, to green card, who will pay? Can you claim the money that you have spent? And that's an important point. Um, normally, under the regulations, there are certain items you can never recuperate directly or indirectly. However, 
if you sustain damages, for example, an employee walks off an important project, you end up losing the project, you can sue the employee for actual damages. It's not a policy or a practice we want to fall into, but it's good to know what your rights are. Okay, some of these things you could put down that, you know, look folks, um, we respect your rights and we respect, you know, um, your liabilities and your own uh, commitments as an employee, but understand something that we as an employer have similar commitments. And if you walk off and it causes a damage, we will sue you for the actual damages sustained as well as perhaps consequential damages, which is the amount you have cost us by leaving as a direct consequence of your leaving, whether it involves loss of goodwill, uh, loss of credibility, um, all of these things we can actually take to court if we have to. Okay, uh, it's a good thing to give notice to people. Um, then what to include for compliance, that's a very long topic. I will probably not um, be able to even cover the basics of it right now, but we'll cover it as we develop the conversation further. I'll let you know when we do that, and we'll of course invite you. Uh, disclaimers, I've already put the disclaimers in. It's got to be said clearly, this is not a contract. This is not a promise, either expressed or implied. It does not create or modify any rights in law or in equity. These are two slightly two. Equity is fairness. So you can't claim fairness and come after us saying, uh, you know, even though it's not a contract, it's not fair for us, um, um, for, for the employer not to be held to that. So, and we can change things without notice. These are important points. And one very important aspect of this should be the policy development. It should be reviewed by your in-house counsel. It should be reviewed by management, HR, technical or functional managers, your employment counsel, corporate counsel, all the people, even maybe even government contract lawyers, all the people who could uh, potentially be affected by these decisions should be reviewing them first. Um, in my view, I think it's very, very important to have prevention in place because as I'm sure I'm preaching to the converted already, you, you, will, you will know that once we try to correct problems, just like writing code, once you try to correct code, code, it's so much more difficult than it is to just put in place good coding practices. Similarly, it is so much easier to, to take care of things if we have good policies in place. Any questions on any aspect of what I've talked about, please go ahead. Well, I did want to ask, I know we've been under the impression uh, with regards to like re recouping uh, uh, funds that we've spent on everyone. And I don't think that you can do this, but I want to ask that I have you. Um, what about holding employees responsible, you know, for H1B or green cards for, you know, remaining employees for a certain period of time? Is that not allowed? No. Uh, like ask, no. Like, Bef okay. Before you try to recuperate, please give me a call. As you folks know, when we are when we are the sole source providers for any corporation, we do not charge for any transactional um, um, phone calls or reviews. So you have a problem, it's not gonna cost you anything. Please give me a call. Uh, rule of thumb is you cannot recuperate, recuperate immigration expenses. I have written lengthy articles on this issue. Um, some of them going 20, 30, 40 pages. Um, these are very, very complicated issues. You can always sue for actual damages which arise from performance or the lack of performance, but you can usually not sue and recover amounts spent on immigration um, um, work, okay? There's one part, H1 you cannot recover. One half, the first half of the POM process, green card process, you cannot recover. The later half, which is the I-140, 485, you should be able to recover, but talk with me before you get into that place. We will then discuss, because immigration law is always in flux. We want to make sure we are following the most recent guidelines of the government. Okay, no, that's great. Thank you. Okay. Well, folks, I have nothing else to add, but we will invite you to a much lengthier, much more elaborate discussion, which we will also record like we did this and make publicly available for everyone. So you can read on to the, you can listen into that. Okay. Thank you all. Bye-bye. You too. Every other Thursday at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we host um, 
free community conference calls. Everybody is welcome to join. Some people post questions ahead of time. You can take membership in our forums. Uh, all of the details are there on our website, immigration.com. You can take membership uh, ahead of time and, um, you know, it's instantaneous. It happens right away and post your questions beforehand or you can just log in. Uh, the phone number and all are provided 202-800-8394-1230 Eastern Standard Time every other Thursday. We have uh, free apps for both Apple iOS platform for your iPhones and iPads as well as for Android. Just look for immigration.com immigration.com the period dot and uh, the application should show up.